Offensive coordinator Jay Johnson and freshman quarterback Kaden Hauser speak at practice. So, well, what on earth did they have to say? And also, what do we have to say about some great mailbag questions from, hey, is Jaden Reed a legitimate All-American candidate? To what season would make the best episode of Hard Knocks in Michigan State football recent history? Let's go. Our Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is happening, everyone? Thank you so much for starting your day as we are now two weeks away from kickoff of the 2022 season. Uh, Yeah, thanks a lot for kicking off your day with us. And also, before going any further, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. It's Bet Online where the game starts. All right, before we dive into today's episode, where we talk about what was heard from practice today, I just want to shout this out, please rate, review, subscribe to the podcast or YouTube show. If you're watching on YouTube, hey, comment below. Uh, If you're loving the show, let me know. If you have a segment idea, a question that you want answered, hit me in the comments or lockedonspartans at gmail.com. That's the best place to find us. Uh, Thank you all for your emails. They have been piling up lately, so we get to some of those questions in the second and third segment. But for that we got to dive into some quotes and notes from Michigan State's football practice today. They spoke to the Michigan State media contingent. And as always, before I read off these quotes, have to shout them out. Guys like Chris Solari, guys like Ryan Black, both doing work with the Free Press, Lansing State Journal, Matt Charbonneau too. All these guys tweet out the quotes. So let's get into them right now. Just wanted to credit them before going any further here. So Jay Johnson spoke at length. He hasn't talked uh, too much this offseason, but with... I mean, Michigan State football right around the corner. What what better time to talk to the Spartan media brass than right now? And uh, he talked, of course, about the quarterback battle going on this offseason. And you probably already know by now that, of course, it's not for the starting quarterback role. That's going to be Peyton Thorne's job. No drama, no issues there whatsoever, but more so... What's going to go on behind Peyton Thorne in the depth chart? Right now, uh, he says that, well, he did speak about Thorne, of course, and said, quote, he is playing at a high level right now, but also pointed to Noah Kim as, quote, doing some positive things behind Thorne. Also made a mention that right now, if the game were to start tomorrow, this weekend, perhaps, let's say the Big Ten commissioner, Kevin Warren, says, hey, Michigan State, need you to play this weekend. the, The backup quarterback, Jay Johnson, said, would be Noah Kim right now. Of course, he's been in the program for quite some time since the D'Antonio era. So yeah, this is a kid that's experienced, for sure. So that is who is QB2 right now. However, with that said, who is sticking out behind Noah Kim? Of course, it's Kaden Hauser. And this is a kid that also spoke with the media today. We will get to his quotes in a little bit, but highly touted four-star kid from California. Everyone thinks the world about him. So as the season progresses, it could change who is the backup quarterback. But honestly, hopefully we never have to find out who the true backup quarterback is because, well, if you got to go to your backup quarterback, that means some not some, not, not fun things have happened. Uh, of course, there's other position battles going on on the football team, namely the offense. And that would be the running back battle. That's right. The guy standing next to Peyton Thorne when they do shotgun, obviously. Who is going to be the starter? Is it going to be a committee? How much of a committee is it going to be? And Jay Johnson pointed to three running backs in the battle. Says, quote, Jalen Berger continues to progress. Jarek Broussard is getting back in the groove a little bit. Of course, Jarek Broussard injured for most of last season, if not all of last season. He's had some knee injury issues in his past. So when he says getting in the groove, it's not just learning the offense, but also bouncing back from injury. And the third name being thrown around is Jordan Simmons, according to Jay John. So, there you have it. That's another big storyline going into the uh, the season. Coming up is who is that third running back going to be between Jordan Simmons, Eli Collins, Davion Prim got a lot of shine in spring, and also Auburn transfer Harold Joyner. Will anything come about of his game? 
course, former very highly touted recruit. Michigan State was on him for quite some time. And then eventually in the transfer portal, he flips to Michigan State. So what will he be, if anything? It's going to be a running back by committee sort of deal. Jay Johnson, of course, confirmed that. He said it is going to be a running back committee. Uh, We'll see who the hot hand is. That's not really a surprise, though. When you're replacing Kenneth Walker with some guys that um, not are unknown in college football, but unknown to Spartan fans, unknown to the program. Yeah, it's going to be a running back by committee thing, especially since they also each have different skill sets that make them all unique in their own ways. Now, another massive storyline, I sound like a broken record or a broken record player, however you want to use that idiom, is uh, the offensive line and the depth at offensive line. And Jay Johnson says backup tackles, Brandon Baldwin and Ethan Boyne are showing, quote, positive signs of being contributors on the offensive line and also gave Dallas Fincher a shout-out as well for playing all three positions. So, honestly, we've seen linemen have to be bop around all the time. Kevin Jarvis would play all five line positions any given game, seemingly. So it looks like Dallas Fincher could be that little utility knife that you use when the going may or may not get tough or some guys need a breather. Of course, you also have Washington State transfer Brian Green. He'll be an interior guy, but if Ethan Boyd uh, needs a break or Brandon Baldwin, if you need that third guy at tackle, looks like Dallas Fincher is going to be the guy stepping up uh, on the tackle position. And also, one more player-specific comment. And I do love this one. And we've been talking about him more and more lately. This is true freshman Jeremy Bernard, of course, top 300 wide receiver recruit, highly rated four-star. He's got the physical build of a college athlete already. He's got the speed of a college athlete already. And it looks like it's going to be very probable that we will see Jeremy Bernard a lot early this season. Jay Johnson went as far as saying, quote, I think he's taken a huge step. He looks like a completely different player than he did in the spring. Yes, Jeremy Bernard was an early enrollee, and it looks like only a few months have only been great, great things for Jeremy Bernard. So, hey, it's a stacked wide receiver room. Okay, Jaden Reed, Trey Mosley, who's been here forever. You have Keon Coleman, who not enough things can be said about him, but also as a true freshman to break into this room, it'd be exciting, surprising, but it'd also be massive if he could really be this good to the point where they're sending true freshmen out to the field, not because, you know, they have to appease a four-star kid, but because he legitimately is ready. I mean, that's just how it goes uh, in the Mel Tuck program. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you came from, how highly you're rated, how low you're rated. If you're ready, you're ready. And it looks like Jeremy Bernard could be one of those guys that are ready. Now, the last Jay Johnson quote that we'll go through is he was asked about his play calling, and he said, quote, I'm not afraid to risk it all. I want it to be a calculated risk, if that makes sense. I highly doubt we'll see anything change this season when it comes with Jay Johnson and play calling. Of course, you know, what I mean by that is, yes, it will change that. You know, you can't just do the hand the ball to Kenneth Walker play. But as far as aggression goes, I don't necessarily see that going away. Uh, we saw that with how many flea flickers last year. But also the Miami game had some gutsy calls. The Michigan game had some gutsy calls, like on you know fourth and one, ball at midfield. Instead of running it, eh, let's just flip it out to Jalen Naylor, get a little sneaky right there. Uh, the Penn State game to end the season, they went for it on fourth down, converted three of those times. So, look, he, he's not, you know, never, ever punt. We're going to go for every fourth down type of aggression. But, yeah, he's... He's got some sizzle on that stake, and I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, let's talk about Kaden Hauser's quotes really quick. He had a brief session with the media, nothing too telling coming out, but he did say, he did confirm with the media that Jaden Reed has been, quote, in and out with injuries this month, but has been back practicing with MSU this week. On one hand, I'm very surprised that they let true freshman Kaden Hauser talk. I don't know how many programs let their third string quarterback talk, especially if they're a true freshman. And I can't imagine that they'd be too jazzed with him just outright saying that, hey, yeah, Jaden Reed, he's a little dinged up. Uh, so everyone else look out for that. Other teams, I, it's not the end of the world. I mean, other teams would have a way of finding that out too, but it's just kind of funny to see him and just outright say, say that in his first big media session of this off season. And then also too, he was asked about the differences from high school 
to the college game and says the defense stands out and said senior linebacker Jacoby Winman, quote, had his way with him in practice. So no better wake up call uh, to enter college football than to go up against one of the top 15 tacklers in the nation last year in Jacoby Winman. So yes, welcome to the league, uh, big fella. Again, right now he's QB3. Maybe he gets up to QB2 by the end of the year. And if not for nothing, and this is so stupid to talk about because we haven't even started this season, but next offseason quarterback battle after Peyton Thorne leaves, that's going to be an interesting one. That's going to be a very interesting quarterback battle between Noah Kim, Kate and Hauser. So, uh, yeah, I'm getting way ahead of myself right now. But, uh, hey, that's just – can't, can't help but, but wonder that because that's uh, how my mind works. All right, gang, we will be back in a hot segment with some great mailbag questions. But first, I just got to talk your ear off about betonline.net. That's right. You got your props, your odds, your futures. They got everything you need for this college football season that starts in eight days. That's right, some week zero action. Nebraska, Cornhuskers, Northwestern Wildcats, and Dublin, Ireland – Go wager a few shekels on that at betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your future betting needs and current betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, eSports, and golf. Of course, the best sport to bet on, in my opinion, golf. Uh, bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts, point blank, they got you covered top to bottom. So head to Bet Online today. Use your mobile device. Learn more about the trends and action. That's at Bet Online where the game starts. And before diving headfirst into our mailbag, thank you so much for making Lockdown Spartans your first listen every single day. And also, the ultimate college football preview is here. It's a seven episode seven episode preview with college experts, local team experts, and the Odyssey College Football Insiders. It's everything you need to be ready for the college football season all in one spot. Search for Ultimate College Football Preview on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. All righty, let's take one big plunge into this mailbag. Lockdownspartans at gmail.com. You already know that by now. So Austin knew this as well. And Austin reaches out with a question after a alarming conversation with some friends. Let's just read the email. I recently got into an argument with my non-Spartan friends. Am I crazy to think Jaden Reed could be a top five in receiving yards in the Power Five and or an All-American? He was top 20 in the Power Five last season, and most of those guys ahead of him are now gone. How many other players are going to, one, be as good or better than Reed, two, be as much of a focal point on offense as Reed, and three, have a team as good or better than MSU. And then he goes on to say, I'm not saying he will definitely be a top five or an All-American, but my friends were saying I'm crazy for thinking he has a chance. Austin, I will have what your friends are having, man. Uh, To say that Jaden Reed doesn't have a chance at being an All-American is Looney Tunes. That's okay. (laughs) It's not like we're talking about Montori Foster, you know, a kid that only had nine catches, or Keon Coleman, you know, a guy that we're all high on but really doesn't have any sample size behind him. Okay, Reed has hype for a good reason, and he's also got tremendous sample size behind him. Now, I will side with you here, Austin, that, like, no, I'm not hopping on this microphone saying right now that lock it in. Jaden Reed is guaranteed to be an All-American. No, but... The, the chance is certainly there. I mean, he is. We talked about this on yesterday's show. He is one of two guys in the conference at wide receiver coming off of a 1,000-plus yard season. He is the only guy in the conference returning with double-digit touchdowns from last season. He is one of just 10 preseason all-Big Ten selections. So, yes, it's not just us looking at this through you know green-tinted glasses and drinking that pure green Kool-Aid, like, no, a lot of people expect a big season from him. And also, yeah, we got the guys around him, too, that could take some of the spotlight off Jaden Reed. Like last year, you make hay in the play action because Kenneth Walker's eating up so much attention from the defense that Jaden Reed makes it work. But also, you have Trey Mosley, Keon Coleman, Jeremy Bernard, we just talked about. The tight end room is loaded. You have running backs that are receiver threats this year. Like, that could take some pressure off of Jaden Reed. 
Now, with that said, let's take the other end here, and I'll, I'll try to step into your friend's shoes here and say why it will be tough for him to win All-American, because, of course, it's tough to be All-American. You only give it to three receivers in the whole nation. So here's one reason why it could be tough. And, okay, I'll say the obvious one, injuries, right? We just talked about that in the first segment, that what if he gets a little dinged up, misses two games, four games, what have you? Okay, obviously, that's going to hurt the All-American campaign. But also, now this is interesting because I did look this up today. Peyton Thorne doesn't spread the ball around as heavily. I'm sorry, Peyton Thorne spreads the ball around more heavily than maybe a lot of us think. Of course, whenever we tune into a Michigan State broadcast, you hear that Peyton Thorne, Jaden Reed, high school teammates, how cool is that? They have great chemistry. And it's no question that A, the chemistry is there, and B, that yes, Jaden Reed is Peyton Thorne's favorite receiver, but it's not as heavily skewed to Jaden Reed as I actually thought. Um, of Peyton Thorne's completions in the last two years, 27.5% have gone to Jaden Reed. That's obviously a big slice of the pie, but I also looked at other Michigan State quarterback to wide receiver connections just to look at a comparison. Kirk Cousins and B.J. Cunningham in 2011, that was a higher percentage. 29.5 of Cousins' completions were to B.J. Cunningham. And when you think, all right, screw it, so-and-so is down there, they're going to be open, let me just chuck the ball. Kind of like how sometimes Peyton Thorne did with Jaden Reed last year. Even higher than that was Connor Cook and Aaron Burbridge. And this was a whopping skew towards Aaron Burbridge. Of Connor Cook's completions in the 2015 season, 37.1% were to Aaron Burbridge. Uh, that That is sending the ball to one guy's way. A lot more than you are the other guys. So with that said, yes, he is surrounded by great weapons that can take pressure off Jaden Reed. But on the contrary, Peyton Thorne can also find a lot of other guys, too, from the tight ends to those receivers, young and old. So, yes, Jaden Reed is going to be the focal point of this offense, but there are a lot of other good additions around him that will maybe take away some targets, some receptions. So that could be it right there. However... It's not always a perfect formula that you have to keep feeding a guy constantly. Like, for example, Jamison Williams from Alabama, he just got 21.5% of Bryce Young's completions. But then again, Jamison Williams' athleticism, out of this world. Hey, look, I, I, think, the, I think the world of Jaden Reed, still not even on the same planet as what Jamison Williams is. So that, there you have it. I Long and short, Yes, of course he could be an All-American candidate. That, your friends are your friends are too harsh, man. That's that is brutal. Anyway, okay, so let's go to question number two here. This is from Zachariah. I hope I'm saying that right. I was debating between saying Zachariah or Zacharia. Either sound cool. It's a great name either way you slice it. So he says, hi, Matt. What do you think is the ceiling and floor for a Spartan basketball team this upcoming season? And how deep do you think they can go in the tournament? I love that question because... And I'm sorry for doing this. I'm part of the problem. A lot of us have been talking about basketball this offseason because of the recruiting. And the 2023 class, who we won't see until not this fall, but the next fall. So, yeah, thanks for having me keep my eye on the ball there with that question. That, yeah, we do have a season coming up this year. Right now, uh, bracketologist extraordinaire Joe Lenardi, of course, because it's the middle of August, came out with the first bracket of the upcoming season, and he's got our Michigan State Spartans locked in as a eight seed right now, which you can make a lot of arguments two or four against. I, any way you slice it, eight seems probably appropriate. Um, so where's the floor for this team? Uh, and I'm going to use you know a pretty liberal definition of what you mean by floor and ceiling here. And by floor, let's get the bad stuff out of the way. This is the doomsday scenario, but... Home NIT game, and I'm not saying that I'm going to expect that to happen or think it's going to happen, but if you want to talk absolute floor, yeah, you you do struggle a lot more than you did last year. Injuries happen. Uh, you know, Joey Hauser reverts back to his midseason form last year, and I don't mean that in a good way. Uh, Malik Hall disappears far too often, maybe like he did at the end of last season. The hole at center is way more gaping than we ever thought it could be. Uh, Tyson Walker just refuses to shoot the ball, so – you have all that happen. It's going to be a grimy Big Ten year. It may be home NIT games the floor. I would highly, highly doubt it, though. 
Now the ceiling, let's talk about this. Now this is a fun one to talk about. The ceiling, last I checked, Tom Izzo's still the coach. And last I checked, he's got more Final Fours amongst active coaches than anyone else. So I think the ceiling's a Final Four team. And hear me here. I mean, look, let's say Joey Hauser is him. Right, let's say he was that guy that we saw to end last season, that guy we saw against Davidson. Let's say Malik Hall comes in with a new attitude as leader of this team, and he's assertive, takes control of the game more times than he doesn't. Let's say Tyson Walker actually wants to shoot the ball, shoots above 40% from three a game, and takes like six-ish threes per game. Let's say Jackson Kohler is the real deal in the paint. Let's say Matty Sissoko has a major step up into his junior season and also What if A.J. Hogard is going to be the true leader that we all think he is going to be at point guard? And, oh, yeah, let's not forget Jaden Akins, a guy that a lot of us have a lot of stock in. Let's say he is worth the hype, and he does skyrocket that quick to stardom in his sophomore season. And then add in what Pierre Brooks becoming a reliable sixth man, and that's the making of a Final Four team right there. But with that said, odds that all happens – Every single thing I just named, it, it's low. That, that's quite the, the parlay card that I just listed off. But, hey, I, some of that's going to happen. You know, I, I would expect a lot of growth to happen in the offseason. So, with that said, let me have a short answer to your great question. Is I think it's going to be anywhere from a six seed to a nine seed in March. And I think it's going to be a season that ends this first weekend troubles they've been having lately. Obviously. Okay, it's going to be a lot easier to get to that second weekend if you're a six seed than it is an eight or a nine seed and you're playing that first seeded team in the second round. But a lot of variance with this Michigan State team, and that's why I like Izzo scheduling as tough as he has, as if he would ever change, is because we're going to get a really good look at Michigan State and really get a, a good, good look and a good expectation of what this team can be moving forward. Uh, next question right here. What MSU seasons would have made the best Hard Knocks episodes? And what are your thoughts on Aiden Hutchinson as you've been watching this season? And I actually have been watching this season. Of course, it's the Detroit Lions, the team that I'm going to buy back into, like the absolute complete sucker that I am, Um, because I don't know any better. Uh, Anyway, what do I think about Aiden Hutchinson? I don't, like, this is a, yeah, I mean, you can, you know, believe me or not believe me, but I I really don't have an opinion on him either way. He's just another guy that went to Michigan, so of course I'm not like, woo, let me get the Hutchinson jersey. Like, no, I just don't really have a a big opinion on him. And I think what helps, too, is that it's not like he hurt us the last two years, so I'm not really affected by all the hype that he's getting on hard knocks. I mean, uh, he looks to be a, a pretty good player, but... With that said, and now I'm going off on a tangent, I, I think I'm done with the storylines of their families here in Hard Knocks. Uh, if any of you guys are watching the show, a lot of Hutchinson talk, a lot of Hutchinson family talk. I'm ready to go on to the other, like, 90 guys that are still in Lions camp. Anyway, like, it's good for him. Local kid, hometown team. Okay, we get it. He's set for life. He's got an outstanding life. He's going to be set in the NFL. I like the storylines on Hard Knocks that are the guys, like, scrapping for, like, that th- third string job or the practice squad job or really come from a unique background. So that's kind of where I stand on that. Now with the Michigan state answer to this question, because after all, this is locked on Spartans. What seasons would have made the best hard knocks? So hard knocks, if you don't know, excuse me for you know waiting this long to describe it, but it's a show on HBO and it follows an NFL team throughout the preseason as they lead up to kickoff. Now, there is now a Hard Knocks in season that they will be following. Last year, they did the Colts. This year, they'll follow the Cardinals for a few weeks. But let's do old, tried-and-true Hard Knocks. Which preseason would have been best for Michigan State? Uh, Look, post-Rose Bowl season would have been electric, right? Everyone's buzzing. You return Connor Cook, the coaching staff. Michigan State is on this new mountain that they haven't been to in decades That would have been fascinating to see the Spartans, see how they're preparing for a massive 2014 season. So, like, that would be a fun one. Or another fun one, as they were climbing to the mountaintop, this was off of a Big Ten season, a Big Ten winning season, I should say, is the buildup to that 2011 season as well. Senior captain Kirk Cousins, you know, B.J. Cunningham, Nikos Allen, you have a young Max Bola, Jarrell Worthy, 
that was a stacked team that was starting to find their footing in the Big Ten. It was a nice build up in the Mark D'Antonio era. 2010, they win that Big Ten title. They had their sights on Pasadena the next day, or the next year, I should say. Playing in that first Big Ten championship was their goal, and they accomplished that goal, but what went into that offseason? And last but not least, I, this is the obvious number one answer, and I, I won't even hear an argument against this. The, the 2020 offseason, right? I mean, that would be a dynamite offseason to just get a behind-the-scenes look at. Look, you got D'Antonio retiring out of nowhere, okay? You have Mel Tucker coming in. Now, of course, Hard Knocks only do the, for the few weeks leading up to the season, but that would be fascinating, too, because, okay, the Big Ten season, it's canceled. Sorry, COVID happened. Uh, we're not going to play football this year. Oh, wait, hold on. Yeah, actually, we are. Okay, season's back on. Everyone scramble, get together, let's start to practice. Oh, and hey, here are all these protocols. Oh, and by the way, you haven't met a lot of these players in person yet. And uh, do you want to try to recruit kids over Zoom as well during the whole season? Like, look, I, I know the 2020 season wasn't great by any means. There was only two wins, uh, one against Michigan and another against the top 15 Northwestern team, in case anyone forgot. But fascinating season right there. Now, if I can go in season, look, last season's up there. You know, just banging out an 11 win season, that stunner against Michigan, uh, the great Penn State game. Like, even the Miami game would be a fascinating episode to see how they built up to that game in Coral Gables, where it was like 138 degrees anyway. Uh, but I, I mean, the two seasons that for in season would be great are the obvious ones 2015 season, uh, the March to the College Football Playoff, all the heart attack games they had in that season, and then also uh, the Rose Bowl season. Right. Hey, it's a boring answer, but sometimes the boring answer is the correct answer. So that's what I got for you right there. And last but not least, uh, again, locked on Spartans at gmail.com. What Spartan Stadium upgrade would we add? Uh, a lot of Spartan fans got sent a survey about Spartan Stadium, what additions they would like to see, you know, like club seating, uh, private cabana seating, field level suites, all that good st stuff that's going to be way way, way outside of my price range. Uh, so really, I, they sent that one to the wrong guy. But regardless, there could be some changes in Spartan Stadium coming, especially premium seating. So what Spartan Stadium upgrade would I add? I've thought I've daydreamed about this, actually. Um, if, if Alan Haller wants to give me a call, I could really walk him through the blueprint in my head. But Spartan Stadium, the north end, they got the two smaller screens. They're still big screens, but they're the smaller screens. How about in between those screens in the north end zone? You have like a viewing deck up there. That's also a beer garden. It's, it's kind of like what they have. Think AT&T Stadium down in Dallas where the Cowboys play. They have multiple levels where fans can just stand on the rail and watch. It's standing room only. Of course, they got bars behind them, uh, food behind them. I think that'd be a cool little area for Spartan Stadium. You can just make it one level. You don't have to go three tiers with it, just like, you know, the Cowboys do, but... I think I don't know. I don't know how the construction would work. It's above my pay grade, but in between those two scoreboards is where you put a beer garden, a stand area, a nice little food emporium, if you will. I think it'd be a great place for fans to watch a game. Uh, you know, just walk around. Obviously, you can still see a big screen as the one of the south end zone can be seen from Neptune, for crying out loud. So, yeah, I think that would be a great addition to Spartan Stadium. Now, I don't think that's what is going to happen because, again, the survey I was sent uh, had a lot of, you know, <laughs> seating options where the season tickets would be well in the thousands, and I don't think this would be an opportunity for that. But, hey, I've been wrong about many things before. I don't really understand how all that works, so maybe uh, maybe that is indeed what they could be adding. Stay tuned to find out. Alan Haller, my phone is always available for your calls. Uh, gang, thank you so much for making us your first listen every single day as we are now. Two weeks away from kickoff. Keep it here. Uh, on Monday, we will be talking with John Garcia, of course, the recruiting expert uh, for football at Sports Illustrated. That's how we're going to start our week. And then you know where to keep it, guys. Five days a week right here, locked on Spartans. Love you all. Have a great weekend. Go